Episode four of the Holt Naylor Show is about to begin. We just want to say thank you to our sponsors, Worth Chiropractic, Anson Belts. We couldn't do it without you guys. We also couldn't do it without the fans. You guys have made these first three weeks uh, great, and we just want to say thank you to you guys. On the other side of this break, we got Ruff McNeil, ECU legend and Hall of Famer on the line. We hope you enjoy the show, but if not, as always... Holt Naylor turns, and Holt will take off and run himself. He's at the 40-yard line. Holt Naylor's to the 30. Look at him go. 20, 10, 5. Touchdown, Pirates. There's local politics, bud. It's showtime. Episode 4, the Holt Naylor Show with the walk-ons. And on the other line, we got ECU legend Coach Ruffin McNeil. Coach, can you hear us? Yep. I'm going to put you on the stand. Yeah, I'm going to learn how to use this electronic stuff, dog. Hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I'm old school, dog. Oh, yeah, for sure. I know. I got something to give you. Something at the place. I can... Okay. You got a little stand. No, you can't see me, though. There you go. Can we see him, Drew? <laughs> yep. Yep. We're good. Cool. Well. I'm ready Coach, you are. all right, let's go. Hey, uh, appreciate you for joining. I know first thing I want to talk about is you don't like enjoying uh, coaching in that red, do you? Be honest. <laughs> well, you start right off with the fire question. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? i tell you what it is. Yeah, and I'll tell you what. Oh, this, uh, you know, when I left uh, Oklahoma to come back to take care of my dad, I've known Coach Dorn since he was your age right now. I've known that long. So I came back and uh, he offered me a position here. And I just like working with young men. You know how it was when Oliver, you as a ninth grader, dog. Oh, absolutely. You know I mean? Yeah. So I just like, I love working with kids, man. And, uh, you know, so it, I, it's, it's been great. They treat me nice. And uh, I, I look I, every day, man, I, I get a chance to meet some some great kids and, uh, and try to take them to a place that they can't go by themselves. Heck yeah. Hey, Ruff, Caden here. I just wanted to ask you a quick question. You mentioned knowing Holton since ninth grade. I was curious. Before what made I don't know if this is a kid. Yeah. <laughs> what, what made you go out there and feel confident in offering Holton Aylers as a ninth grader? I knew him before then. Uh, when he was playing like Little League baseball. That was his deal. You know, everybody thinks football, he <laughs> was really good at that. But, but uh, I remember that. And then his dad and I, boy, we've had a relationship for a long, long time. Um, and, uh, you know, just, you know, uh, the, the, the first time you meet him, number one, as a, as a person, uh, you want him on your team, period. Then as a quarterback, leading the team, period. And then, you know, you knew he was going to do, any, do anything, do everything every day to get better. Uh, how do I know that? I've just been doing it so long and watching young men so long, you could see – uh, he was going to be easy to coach and easy to lead, and it was proof. And and his legacy is there forever there, in East Carolina. So so you saw the Ailer size early on, and then you saw the home home run record in Little League, and you're like, you know what? There's some potential there. <laughs> he can go. He can go. Yeah, he, he, he had to. He was young and talented, and then uh, when I got a chance at that time, I think I don't know. Hope you may help me. I think that's the first time we could offer him as ninth grade. I can't yep. remember. Yeah, so that's the first time I could officially offer him. So I did, and uh, it was it was uh, it was good, you know. Yeah, I remember uh, one of the funny things about that is I remember you coming to Conley that day, and I had I remember Coach Pascal at the time was like, "Look, Coach Ruff's going to come, uh, and I think he wants to meet with you." Is after my freshman year, and I'm like, "The heck, do you want to meet with me for? <laughs> like, I'm in ninth grade." <laughs> and uh, he Coach was just like, "Look, you know, you got an offer from us, right?" And I was like. No, sir. I didn't know that. Actually. You did say that. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know what? I remember that, Hope. I remember yeah. that. <laughs> oh, I'll remember it for the rest of my life. And uh, obviously grateful for it. And, uh, you know, everyone around you knows the passion that you had for ECU. Um, I remember even you coming back, you know, my senior year when you were with State. I remember seeing fans in the, in the stands warm-ups with signs saying, welcome back and all that. You know, I just kind of wanted to know, uh, what was that like being on the opposite side, you know, coaching against us? I know you were pulling for us a little bit, Coach. I know you, you had to have been. <laughs> but uh, what, what was that day like for you? You know, you know what? I, it was it was the strangest day. I mean, this is my – I'm going to get in my 45th year coaching, 45. Uh, I've coached over 500 ball games. I've been in 
you name the palace from Rose Bowl to, to all of it, you know, cotton bowls, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, orange bowls. And, uh, that game was, I've never first take it back to 1976 as a true freshman at 17 years of age. I've never been in that stadium as an opponent. Yep. I've always been on the home sideline as a coach, as a player, as a coach. Uh, and, uh, Man, when the game was going on, I was it was sort of like uh uh man, I was just uh in a zone a little bit, you know, watching you run and watching you run around and you know, watching the field goal and, and just watching how we competed and both teams competed hard. It's always been a hard nose rivalry since I was a player. You know, my first start was against state as a freshman. Oh wow. You know, yeah, back in seventy seven. And uh, we won the game. I was lucky to be in the right place at the right time, made the tackle at the end of the game, and, and won it. So my first start ever, East Carolina, was against North Carolina State. Oh, that's sick. That's, yeah, that's crazy. I mean, bed bug crazy. You know, and um, so getting in, being in the, in, in the stadium, seeing the fans, and I saw those signs, uh, it touched my heart. Uh, and at the end of the game, uh, it was a feeling I've never felt before, you know, because I am a competitor like you. And I do want to win uh, by one. That's all I care about winning. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care about blowing, we blew, nah, I don't care about blowing people out. They get mad at me sometimes when I do interviews. I, say, I, just, <laughs> I want to win by one and back up out of there, moonwalk out of there. You know, because it still counts in that left hand column, right? You know, so for sure. Yeah. So anyway, that game was hard. It was difficult. Then knowing you since you're a peace jabber, uh, and watching you do well, and and. Uh, 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 you know, and then you know, seeing the team and the, the fans, it was uh, it was a different experience for me. I've never felt like that before, and I've been in some tough ball games, big ball games, championship ball games, all that kind of stuff. But that game was it was different for me. It was even weird for me. I remember like leading up, you know, seeing the signs pregame. But I remember like leading up to it, I was asked questions in the media about you because I mean, obviously, you were the first coach to offer me. Uh, yeah. We have a great relationship, so. It was even weird for me seeing you in red as a fan and now a player and like all that. Yeah. So, um, but obviously you're a pirate at heart. Uh, you, you, like you said, you've had some great memories here and then coaching elsewhere. What is your favorite ECU memory of all time? Wow. Uh, that first game as a starter in 77 has to be a part. Um, winning the first game at home and, and, and Dottie Ficklin last second pass to uh, to win that game against Tulsa. Yeah, that was wild. Game. Yeah, that was a wild game. It was the first game as a head coach uh, in the stadium, and we won, you know, and then we had to come the next week and play North Carolina State with Russell Wilson. You know, they had a really good team, and, you know, th those sort of combined there. Um, you know, being able to uh, – it, it's a different feeling, and I tell the guys here that now. When you have gone as a student there and graduated, and now you have played there, and now you coach there, you care about everything a few times as much and more. Hundred percent. That you relate, relate with that, relate that. But I've been there as a student, graduated as a, a a player now, and then as a coach. So that was a tremendous feeling, just being able to do that. I was able to give back and do some things there around and help people, you know, in the neighborhood and establish some good causes. But, uh, you know, my motion, I, 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 I ended with this, being around the, 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 the kids uh, was it was enormous for me. Uh, and I always, that's my that's my deal. You know, I'm, I'm a great dad. Uh, I'm a really good husband and granddad. But I really, really love football. That's why I do the best, right? Yep. And I love being around young men and help helping them grow, uh, helping them mentor in any kind of way I can. And that part was always was uh, able to talk to them in, a, in, a, in an angle Holden, that I I could approach them from any kind of angle they wanted to, from student to player to uh, to coach. So that was that was big. You certainly left your mark here. I mean, I was, you know, three, four years after you. And I mean, even today, you know, these guys still play to I me. Mean, your presence is still felt here and the passion that you had for it um, is still felt. And then even more now with one of your former players coming back to coach here in Damon Magazine, you talked about the state game. How cool is it to see, you know, him 
go from a player under you to making that big play as a freshman versus NC State versus Russell Wilson to now being back here as the safeties coach at ECU? Uh, great question. It, Zoo was my last, imagine this, first year as a head coach. Uh, had to eat like 10 meals a day. Go, you know, I hated that. That was the worst part of my <clears> home <throat> visits. You had to eat full course meals every stop. And I go to coach, I go to his dad, you know, Dave, of course, who passed away. Uh, Dave was a coach. He knew the deal. He knew I was the last stop. The last house I went to, I was going into, and DK took me in there, Donnie Patrick. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so he, he looked out for me. We didn't have to eat a meal. We just snacked and had, you know, appetizers. And to be around Zoo as a as that family, I call him Mags, but Mags is his name. I had to be around Mags, <laughs> get Mags there. And his first, you know what? His first start. His first start was against North Carolina State. And he, <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. And he picks off the pass in the end zone uh, and uh, overtime to, to ice the game. And uh, he, he called me as soon as he got the job. And uh, he's in the office that I dedicated to the, the university. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that was very cool. So uh, I'm proud of Mags. And, uh, you know, he's back. He's a ball coach, too. Hope oh, he's a he's, he's a heck ball yeah. Coach. Hey, that's what the Pirates he's, need. He's, he's gonna do good, man. You know that. You know him for sure. And, uh, yeah, and when he relates to him, he'll get after him. But he's uh, he's also uh, uh, just a great person. He'll, he'll be a great ambassador for East Carolina. Well, he has been even this early in his career, and now in his coaching career too. Uh, he's killed it, Kate. I think he Kate has a question for you. Yeah, rough. I was uh, you know. I played in my freshman year is 2017, so I played with a lot of your former players that were older upperclassmen. Uh, when I got here and learned from a lot of them. And all I've ever heard from those players who played under you was just how awesome of a coach you were, but also how awesome of a person you were and how much, you know, they felt like they connected and, you know, connected with you genuinely as a person. And we all know this. Some coaches have that and some coaches don't. Um, you know, I was just curious, you know, what did you do differently and how did you foster that flame with those kids to make sure, you know, they felt connected, but also being a ball coach at the same time? Man, you know, first, uh, I have a philosophy, and it's there are three words. It's trust, commitment, and caring. Everything I do it will be built around that, even now and in life, but as a coach. And we earn each other's trust. I earned their trust. They had to earn mine as well. It's two-way street. Then I want to know who was committed because they knew, and I had to be committed as well. And then I, I care about them, and I know they cared about me. I think sometimes those school coaches say, well, as long as they – Respect me. I don't care if they love me. I I'm, I disagree with that fact. I, mm -hmm. I think you got your players have to care about you and love you. You got to earn that too. And again, it goes both ways. Uh, I was always bluntly honest with them. Bluntly honest, you know. And, and I would tell them. And players that. like that. Players love that. They, they do. They do. I agree. I agree. I'm still that way now. You know, even though it's changing and new things are coming in. You, do you want to do? Or do you, you? I ask them, are you really sure you want blunt honesty? And I give it straight to them. And then. Uh, you know, the thing that, that uh, I think that they, they understood, because when you, when you and you know this, when you when you have blood in the bricks, quote, quote, that's what they call it, you know, and I've I, I been the same, been on the same grass and, and played there, I can say things to them that a lot of people can't say. Mm -hmm. I, can say I can say things to them, uh, and, and I can challenge them to the max. Uh, and, and other people, they, they can try that, but... I thought that may have been different, a different part there, but they also know I love and care about them, and I wanted nothing from them but to be successful in life. That's all I ever wanted, and that's all I still want right now. I want them to be great in life, and uh, you know, always trying to find a way to take them to a level they couldn't go by themselves. Yeah, I agree. That's I think the the biggest coaches I ever had the biggest connections with was the one that made you earn that respect. They worked, you know, you kind of had that blunt honesty with each other. They worked you hard to death, but then out of that, you know, that mutual relationship building, you you build a relationship that's just that lasts for you know decades, for sure. It does. You know, I tell you one, and and my when I came to East Carolina, the reason I the first people to offer me, just like with with, with Holton, was was East Carolina, and uh, the coach there was Pat Dye, and. Um, you know, once he offered me, then all the schools started coming up after me. And I, and, and I, I, but I committed to East Carolina, and I was going no other place. I was talking about my dad, who was tough and hard-nosed. And then I went to play for a coach, Pat Dye, who was the first coach to leave the legendary Bear Bryant staff 
at, at Alabama to come and be a head coach, one of the first. And he was, man, he barbecued us. We were <laughs> every day. God, he was grinding. And then we had three days. Not one of days. We had three days. Yeah, one in the morning. You know how Greenville was. And then one at 12. And then one in the afternoon. One in the after, later on in the afternoon. And it was three days. And, and uh, we had county fair in the middle. Uh, it was uh, it was brutal, but at the same time we knew he cared about us, and uh, he always talked to us, not at us. That, if that makes sense. Oh, it's a you huge know, difference. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes people talk at you, but uh, he always talked to us, and I appreciate that because that's how my dad coached me. He was taught me too. My dad was, and I needed to be around a, a, a man and uh, God rest his soul like Pat died, and uh, he, uh, so. Uh, that that had a big influence on me on, on on my coaching style. And then I'll stop right here. The next one, the next coach I went to college and, and coached under was Danny Ford at Clemson, who had played offensive line for Coach Die at Alabama. So my coaching was my dad, Coach Die, and then college coaching was Danny Ford. So the toughness, the the, the the real real recognizes real quote quote we always say that but uh, uh, those influences helped helped a lot. Yeah, what what's up, coach? This is Jack here. Um, hey, Jack. In your last question with Caden, you kind of talked about how college football and the whole landscape of all of it is changing now. Uh, obviously, with the transfer portal and NIL, how do you still kind of make an effort to keep it about the people and the process? Um, that you've kind of always coached with and just been around the game with? You know, one thing about Dave, and I know he, I don't know outside people of this and that, but I've known him so long, and he relies and believes in things I, I suggest or he asks questions. One thing that we, we, we you have to make sure you say is is your culture. It's not how fast he, he runs, how big he is. It's will he fit, fit in the culture. And uh, it is an important part. And, you know, you have to – learn to adapt uh, if you want to stay in this. And uh, we have. We've had to learn how to adapt. Uh, and with that, when you recruit them and you got to be on top, hopefully you have a relationship with them prior to them coming to visit your school as a, as a transfer. Right. Uh, and, and that way you know the background. You know uh, how they grew up. You know what they their likes and just like what kind of people they are. That's, that, I think that's the most important thing now. Uh, and uh, and then when they come into your program, you got to have a culture set where everyone understands. Here's our philosophy. They're around the players more than you, so the players are the first ones they'll touch uh, and 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 rely on for influence. So that that that, that that's the main thing. And then you never neglect the high school recruits as well. So it's a blend right now. We had, well, I think we have 31 newcomers here right now at mid-year. Uh, what I do is observe. I watch. I talk. I teach. Like in the morning, we have a teach. Uh, I teach a class with the football team. It's all first year, all for first year players, freshmen, yeah. first year now. And uh, we teach them. It's, it's the development. We teach them how things that how we operate, things they have to be aware of, and so forth. Financial teaching now, with, like you said, NIL. Uh, so it's a change, and I enjoy the 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 chance or the coaching life that you have to adjust. And I made a promise to myself and to Erlene that if I when they I will get out when they won't listen to me. Right. If, if I can't reach it. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, I think you hit it on the nail or hit the nail on the head there uh, when you're talking about the culture and stuff, just with how often teams are changing. Like you're almost having a completely brand new team each year now. So I think that was kind of perfect for that. Coach, you, uh, we've kind of talked about it a little bit, but college football is all about the people. And as a head coach, obviously, you're only going to be successful as a staff around you. Looking back at your time, first year coach at ECU, uh, your first time as a head coach here, you hire a 26-year-old OC. People may have called you crazy at the time, but he ended up being one of the best OC and quarterback coaches of all time in Lincoln Riley. What made you, at that age for him being 26, what made you see the confidence in him to go after him um, and bring him here as the OC so young? 
You remember I mentioned these three words of trust, commitment, and caring? Yep. Uh, th- that's my base. With, with, with that trust, it's also verified trust. Lincoln was an 18, 19 year old student quarterback who, tra- who came in from Muleshoe, Texas, at Texas <laughs> Tech. <laughs> he was a walk on. And we had some really good quarterbacks out there. We were throwing the football and had Cliff Kingsbury and some guys that could really toss it. And Mike, Coach Leach asked him, hey, look, you know, just move into a student role. So I watched him grow from a student assistant where he had zero money to a graduate <laughs> assistant where he had like $1. For money, and then I watched him get a full time job at Texas Tech. And each each level, he coached like he's making a six figure salary. Heck yeah! Each, and and we developed trust between amongst each other. He would come by all the time in my office, and I would barbecue him, you know, and get after him. <laughs> and he didn't do anything wrong, but he just came in to get barbecued like a little test, you know, like <laughs> like pledging a fraternity. And he would come in and. And he, he enjoyed it. And I got to know him. And then I watched him handle kids as a student assistant, GA especially, but then as a full-time coach. Uh, so uh, those led to it. Then I took over the last game. They suspended Coach Leach uh, in the Alamo Bowl. I had to take over as the head coach in that game. And uh, it was a different kind of experience. So that's a whole other story. When I got the job, it was 30 minutes before – uh, the, uh, the we had a first team meeting in the bowl game. I knew right then who I would want to do the the, the play call on offense. I was defense coordinator, so I took it on defense. And I knew I called Lincoln. I said, Lincoln, this is what's happening. And uh, if I could re- have recorded that whole it, that that first game, and you as a quarterback, and heard how fluent he was in his decisions and calls from pass routes to blending plays to trick plays in, in, off of those who played Michigan State and beat them in the Alamo Bowl. And uh, after didn't get the job at Texas Tech, so we all went our separate ways. Yep. I accepted the job at Stanford with Coach Harbaugh uh, and uh, as a defense coordinator. And Lincoln was getting ready to go to Southern Miss and or, or Rice, those two stops. Dang, I didn't know and, that. Yeah, he was getting ready to go. And I got the job uh, while I was at Stanford. He's kind of called uh, – and uh, I got a chance to come in and interview, and I got the job. I called Lincoln right away because I needed to get ready to take a job, one of those jobs. And he came in that day in the in the coach's office with his dragging a suitcase with a suit on uh, and a tie, um, untied, ready to go to work. <laughs> yeah, he's a scrapper, you know. And uh, and then you know he's ready to learn. And like you said, oh, he's great with the quarterbacks and. He got a great uh, imagination in mind with him, and uh, he'll do well at Southern Cal. You just got to keep figuring it out. For sure. I mean, he's definitely made a name for himself post here. I mean, obviously here he came here and lit it up. You know, all y'all did and uh, set records, and then he's only got better from there. So it doesn't surprise me at all that um, he's ended up the where he has. But you know, you were the one who kind of took a shot on him. So props to you. You know what's weird, Holden? It was what? Uh, when I left. Everything's happened in East Carolina. I went to Virginia for a year, and he gets a job at Oklahoma. Yep. And, and he calls me, and I go, what? You know, he said, <laughs> I, he, nobody knew. It was like, so I said, I got a head job. I said, you got what? I said, okay, good. He said, are you coming? I said, what? <laughs> I, I'm fine. And uh, he called me for like three weeks in a row, four weeks. He said, if something happened, would you come? I go, I, I don't know. <laughs> and then I went out, and uh, I looked at it, and I saw him, and when I came in his office at Oklahoma, uh, I had a suit on, my tie and tie, and, and bring a suitcase. <laughs> and, and and I had to call him boss. So that was a different deal. So, uh, but yeah, we keep in touch right now today. We just for sure. back just ten days ago. Yeah. Heck yeah, uh, it was cool stories. Drew, I think has a question from one of the fans yeah. on Twitter. Yeah. Right. Um. So you got a lot of questions from fans when uh, we posted <laughs> your you're coming on. So uh, Kenny Curlings asked, does Coach Ruff still find time to hit the Pamlico River for a good boat ride? No doubt, brother. <laughs> hey, hey, me and my girlfriend, time out. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> yes, sir. That's my baby. Yes, sir. And as soon as I get a chance, I'm, I'm down and I'm – sometimes my phone don't work out there on the Pamlico. Even better. 
Yeah, yeah, and uh, but no, I, 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 that's my, that's my life state, my life jacket. Oh, for getting sure. Around her. Yeah, uh, she, I heard your she, boat she has a name. Her. Yeah, time out. It's time out. Yeah, <laughs> never more hurt. Oh. It's like in the game. Her name is time out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Jack, yeah. You got another Paint question the that they had? Yeah. Uh, Wiley JJ on Twitter asked, uh, in your opinion, what your favorite barbecue sandwich was in Pitt County? <laughs> wow. Uh, let me see. You got Parker's, Sam Jones. Uh, Bees. Bees barbecue is really good. God, God, Lee, all those three. I'd take three sandwiches. You know what they need to do right now? Let's let's challenge them. Send me three sandwiches from that, like, the next couple of weeks. <laughs> let's have a little contest. You know what? I've eaten it, all of them. You know, of course, Parker's has always been the legendary place. And, oh, yeah. Uh, Dan, I mean, all those are great places. Uh, oh, man, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> we got stumped you. That one, they're all great. And uh, when I had to learn how to eat Texas barbecue out in texas that oh that's different yeah this ain't the right kind of barbecue when we uh when we get when coach ever comes back in town we'll have to do a barbecue tour with him yeah we'll we'll have to get him hey we'll do it coach going back towards you know the football conversation you know the the show is the holt naylor show with the walk-ons me jack and drew all being former walk-ons um, and I was curious, you know, what's one value that college coaches find from walk-ons on the college team that most, you know, your average day fans, you know, overlook? If, if, if a young man walks on, first of all, you know right now, and I believe in the walk-on program. Matter of fact, this Sunday we just had a walk-on program here. Um, but I believe in the walk-on program because, one, a young man – and and plus two, if they know they don't get rewarded, which they will. I love the mentality of that chip on the shoulder, uh, and they they know they can play. And they just need the opportunity. Uh, also, in our, any program I've been involved in, whether I was a head coach or not, my philosophy of everybody's somebody, and will be treated the same as the first team uh, player. Uh, everyone is treated the same. Uh, 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 we get out. I get after them just as much as I would the first team guy. I'm teaching the same, and I, I, my coaches would do the same. They teach the same technique, the same philosophy, the same coaching. Right now, and uh, I think when a walk-on player decides to walk on your program, I think you've got a gym there because you know he's coming in hungry, he's coming in ready to work, and uh, he's ready to prove himself every day in practice. Which I love that part. That's that's awesome, Coach. Curious, one walk on that sticks out to you. Who would it be off the top of your head? Got to be Justin Hardy, right? Yeah, oh yeah. You know what? What a great one. You know, <laughs> uh, we're sitting there, and I'm going, man, dude, this guy's <laughs> good. He's a quarterback. Oh you know, yeah. I tell you what, that's a weird situation, and I love Justin, man. Dude, I I still call him Deuce when I talk to him. He's Deuce to me. He's Deuce, you know, and. Been around Michael Crabtree. I don't know if y'all remember him. Oh, yeah. Michael Crabtree was a quarterback. And uh, I just – I like – it was a move being made where it used to be running backs to move them all around. I like the fact that take quarterbacks and, and hope they got great mentality, great athleticism. For sure. And uh, so Crab was a quarterback in, in, in Dallas. And we moved him to wide receiver at Texas Tech. So Justin played quarterback. As well in high school. Yep. And, oh, uh, I remember like, Wes Craven. Yeah, and I, I, I we got him to come over and and uh, I there, there's some practice for him somewhere over there of him catching, making catches in practice. If someone finds those catches, they got a gym. <laughs> you know, they kept showing this catch that uh, OBJ made, like one handed. Justin made that against the Florida a, uh, FAU. Oh, I remember that one in the back of the end zone. Yep. Back of the end zone. He made that say, y'all got the wrong guy. He didn't make that first pick. <laughs> it was just him. And I have to say, Big Bryce, my tight end, Bryce was the, the next one. You remember Bryce? Oh, yeah, uh, Bryce Williams. Bryce was uh, at the Justin, you know, because Bryce came in and and uh, really became a factor uh, and, and catches. There'd be a lot of people. I remember catching Virginia Tech, and, uh, one against Carolina for touchdowns. and yep. But, yeah, but Justin, we had to be the top walk on. And that same fact I just told you. He had to prove himself until the spring. Because in the spring, he got a scholarship. You know what I mean? For but, sure. But, 
Yeah, but he came in with that hungry mentality, and uh, and uh, so anyway, it was it was good to good to be around J- Justin Deuce. I, I I keep trying to call him <laughs> Justin. But he's Deuce. Great For question. sure, Coach. Um, I gotta bring it up because I mean I've been wanting to know for a while. I know ECU fans have. <laughs> The, 20, the 2015 season, obviously, Ben Kirk goes down with an injury. Um, yep. you, you play with Blake Kemp, a backup quarterback, and James Summers. You know, you mix them back in, uh, in and out. You beat Virginia Tech in the rain, which was a huge win. You have close losses to Florida, who ended up winning the East um, in the SEC, and then at BYU as well. Going into that offseason, did you ever expect – um, you know, staff adjustments or for you guys to be let go, or were you just as surprised as the fan base was? I was surprised. Um, uh, it was, the, I thought, you know, we, we lost, uh, I don't know. You remember Cody? Cody? Oh yeah. Uh, yep. Cody was hurt. So not just Ben Kirk, but Cody got hurt. And then we had to play Blake and then we had to play James and, you know, no excuses, or, uh, excuses, tools of incompetence. So, no excuses, but it was it was a setback for a while, and and uh, I thought we'd have a chance. You know, we won five games. Uh, we got beat one of the six games we lost, or so I can't remember which one it was. We were five and seven, I think. Yep. They, we got we got beat, but the rest of the other game, I thought we were in it to the, you know, to the end. But I never thought it would happen, uh, really, honestly. Uh, but you know, things happen, and you, you know, you know, sometimes things happen, and you. You know, you don't know why. Uh, and then you, you know, later find out maybe, you know, uh, I had a higher call, higher call sure. or something else. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, or I know that it set back the program years. I mean, we didn't get back to a bowl game until 2021. I mean, that was a huge difference. Um, I, know, I remember as a fan, I remember where I was. I mean, obviously we had a relationship at that point. But, yeah. I mean, everyone loved you here, and this place was not happy. And, you know, I remember – um, the next year and the years following that, I mean, it was just it wasn't it wasn't the same ECU as when you were here, man. So uh, you made a huge impact. You still make an impact today. I mean, the fans love you here. Um, you know that Thank though. You. But um, we appreciate you joining the show. I think that's kind of it, uh, Caden. Y'all got anything else? Uh, I kind of had one last question. Go for and it. I yeah. saw one of the Twitter uh, fans ask it, and they ask, you know, Coach, would you consider ever if you were offered a homecoming back to ECU in the development role? Or kind of the role you you kind of have at state today. Would you ever consider that potentially? You know, I, I, that's a tough question. Um, you know, I, I, my one of my roles I've always enjoyed the head coaching role put me out of it a little bit. I love being in the background, and I love uh, being able to help and aid. Uh, I never want to be in someone's uh, way or be a distraction from the person in charge of his chance to grasp and galvanize not just the team but the community and the fans and uh, that would be the biggest thing right now is that, you know being in the way of a coach and galvan and his way of galvanizing the team uh, and uh, but I like right now like I've turned out a lot of speaking engagement I've turned out some head jobs I just want to be. I was want to be in the background. Well, my dad was not doing well either, but just want to be in the background. I think it's, uh, you know, it's a great question. Uh, but I sort of, I hope I spoke what I what I sort of looked for. I didn't want. I would never want to interfere with another coach's uh, chance to bring his spirit and philosophy and his his way of doing things, and uh, it might interfere with that. That's a great answer. I mean, it really is. And, you know, you're a legend here. Like I said, everyone loves you. Um, player and a coach, obviously, in the Hall of Fame. You mean a lot to me and my family. To Pirate Nation, thank just you. want to say thank you uh, for coming on, for everything you did for ECU. Um, and we'll talk soon, Ruff. Hey, man, love you guys. Love you, dog. Love you too, Coach. See you. Okay. That was awesome. Yeah, that what was really interview. cool. He's a good dude, yeah, because you and Drew really don't know I, much about him. Yeah, I, I don't know much about him. Um, obviously, maybe need to go to another history class for ECU football, but <laughs> just talking to him like seemed like so genuine. Even like the ending right there, like when you could confidently like get a coach back, yeah, love you, dog, and you're love you too, coach, right yeah. back, like kind of speaks volumes. Um, and like, I feel like only we can kind of 
comment on that because it, it does mean a lot. Like you don't say that to every coach. For sure. And I think, first of all, I appreciate him answering those tough questions uh, about being fired, obviously. And then would he come back? Because like that was, I had that in my notes and totally forgot to ask. So thank you for asking because yeah. that is something that I've wondered as a fan, as a football alumni now, like I'm sure tons of other fans, which someone commented that, like, how do we get this man back here? That was a great and, answer. Uh, it was a great answer, too, is he doesn't want to be in the way, which, I, hey, I understand completely. But, shoot, if I'm ever head coach here, he's going to be the first one I call to come back. It, it makes sense, though. Be, you know, he's been the at the helm of the ship. You know, he doesn't want to overshadow any future coach or, you know, maybe Coach Houston right now. So I totally see what he's saying. He would be a distraction, he feels like, to the team. And it is tough. You know, I think he would love to if he felt like he couldn't be, like, you know, that 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 shadowing figure but i think you know that being that shadowing figure it's the toughest part for him i'm gonna tell you guys a story that three people in the world know um about how bad ecu was off when rough left and now look coach mo he didn't do a great job but whoever stepped in that role if it wasn't nick saban they were i'll explain the story they were not in for a good um they weren't in good for a good setup obviously i mean ecu fans were pissed so about a week before signing day um one of the biggest ECU boosters reached out to me, reached out to my dad, wanted to go to lunch with me and my dad. So I'm like, all right, you know what? I'll go like, hey, I've been to some uh, some lunches and dinners with boosters before on these ACC schools. You know, I know I knew what that what that meant. <laughs> you guys can guess what you want to mean or not, but I knew what that meant. So I'm like, all right, you know, let's go. I didn't know ECU rolled like that, but I'm going to go uh, meet with him. So I remember where it was. I'm not going to say his name, but he was one of – a lot of people would know who it is. He was He at the time was – Top three ECU boosters had a lot of pull, not just at ECU, but around North Carolina. And went to lunch with him thinking it's going to be about NIL under the rug. And it ended up being him literally for the entire lunch telling me not to go to ECU because it was way worse than what people think it is. And he was telling me to go an hour and a half down the road to NC State. Wow. So how did, how did that? Are you muted? How did that end up? Like, did it so, play anything in your mind? So he's sitting here saying, he's like, look, it's administration. Like, there's a lot of things that are happening that you don't see behind the scenes that it's going to take long. It's going to take a long time and someone really special to come in here and change this. Like, you need to go to state. Like, you, I, I, like, I care about you and your family. You need to go to NC State or somewhere else. Don't go to ECU. It's going to take too long to fix. We need someone that when you're going to need kind of a clean sweep, clean rug. And in my head the whole time, I'm like, this crazy 17-year-old Holton thinking, I'm like, well, I'm that guy. I'm the guy to come in and change this thing. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's how bad it really was, was the top donor, one of the top donors at ECU met with me a week before signing day. No one knows this. Um, and was like, you need, you don't need to go here. It's way worse than you think it is. That's insane. Isn't that wild? And it, he was right. If you look at the history, it was it was really bad off. Uh, it was. The teams and we played on, I played on those teams. It was bad. And I, I kind of laugh. Uh, I'd see fans commenting the Ruffin McNeil curse, like the curse of Ruffin yeah. McNeil. And it, if you look back on it, you kind of make a joke about it. It was kind of like the curse of what happened. It was and like, you know, all that stimulated. It was three years after when Coach Mo was there. He, was, he wasn't winning at that time, but like, it all stimulated from firing Coach Ruff and the anger within the donors because the donors were mad too. Jeff Comfer, like, Ruff just said he was surprised. If Ruff wasn't expecting it, like, the donors definitely weren't mm -hmm. expecting it. The fans certainly weren't expecting it. The players weren't. So, like, it was just anger throughout. I remember there was, like, a petition of, like, over thousands of people to bring him, sign to bring him back and stuff. Like, it was a big deal that he got fired. So when you went to that lunch, was he already fired and the new coach was already in? Yeah, so Coach Mo had been there for, like, two years at that oh. point. Oh. But – it was still to the point where, like, the donor, he was giving money to ECU. And, like, at the time, I'm not hyping myself up, but, like, I was the the hometown, like, big-time recruit quarterback. Right. Um, at the position that you really need to have to win. Yeah. And one of their biggest donors is like, don't come. It's not it's not worth you ruining your career. Over. Like, those words were I wonder what he set. knew, like, exactly that made him have that meeting with you. Or is it Ooh. just going to practice? I mean, I know like – I know some stuff in administration wise that not with this, not with John Gilbert and all them. I'm not trashing them at all. Um, with the previous administration, like I knew some things that were going on that were, I mean, he fired the best coach, one of the best coaches of all time, most loved coaches of all time. Yeah, and not only that, most genuine coaches. I, I never met Coach Ruff until tonight. Yeah. And all I heard, you know, my freshman year, sophomore year, the guys that played under him was how genuine of a person he was. 
and I've heard that through the stories, but you really felt that in that interview and just when he was on a couple minutes before we started recording, just how like funny and genuine he was as a person. You, yeah. You love that. I mean, he wrote a kid's book here. He was going to elementary schools. You'd see him walking around. Like he was just a genuine good dude. Still is. Um, and I was serious about Jack. You probably remember it or Drew, you do too. Is like in the stands, you guys might not have noticed it, but that 2022 game, my senior year versus state, like he was on the sidelines for state, obviously. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing signs and like, I was getting asked some questions in the media about, you know, I got offered him when I was 14, like we said, and, like, people are like, well, are you going to talk to him before the game and all this? And, like, I did te- – we texted back and forth. But I didn't talk to him. He was locked in. I was locked in once the game started, but I did text him earlier that week. But it was wild. I mean, it was national news when he got fired. So, um, he's definitely left an impact. And those those couple years after, like, his impact was still felt because people didn't want Coach Mo there. They wanted Ruff there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, coolest thing I saw on Twitter today was uh, one story about his his family and being a Lumberton hometown hero. But another one was, uh, you know, food delivery driver just getting getting to see Ruff every day and waving at him while he's walking. Like he I really saw left an impact. Campus, yeah. yeah, he really left an impact around here, and it's it was really cool to get to meet him today. Still being felt. You know, Donnie obviously was here last year, which is what it is. He did a good job. But now Damon Magazoo obviously here um, as a safeties coach played for him. Um, He's got a lot of guys. Uh, Trip Weaver, who was here last year, yep. obviously he was a GA here. I don't even know if y'all knew that he was yeah. a GA under Ruff, yeah. and then so he's still got a lot of guys under his coaching, coaching tree now. Tree. And Ruff was under that Mike Leach coaching tree, which was pretty cool. I wanted to ask him about some Mike Leach stories, but we kind of went over on time. But um, he's got his own little ECU coaching tree now, going out there and making impact in the coaching world, which is pretty cool. Really I, cool. I loved when he uh, mentioned the whole flip with him and. Uh, Lincoln. Lincoln. Yeah. He was wearing yeah, the suit. Yeah, cool. He was wearing the suit. You love those stories. Also, didn't know he was going to be Harbaugh's DC at in Stamp at Stanford. Yeah, that's that pretty sick. Yeah, great interview. Yeah, that was cool. ECU legend for sure. Um, episode four, boys. It's been it's going by fast. It really is. It's it's been fun. But uh, let's go ahead. We're we're not going to do too much after this because obviously that interview was great. One thing I want to kind of stick with is you know we talked with, even with him and we've talked about in the previous episodes is this new world of college football, college athletics with NIL. Uh, we were talking all fair, actually at an ECU basketball game, about what would we do with $100,000 NIL right now if we were giving it to a program. Say we were giving it to ECU. We, if we were a donor giving $100,000, what would you do with the money? Why? Would you split it up? What would you do, Caden? You go first. Yeah. So I was thinking about this transfer class. Like We have such a great transfer class if you're looking at it. Hopefully they all perform great. Hopefully there's no bust. Hopefully we just have an awesome class. But I was looking at it like, where could the possible gaps be on the football team? And I was still thinking the offensive line. I just, the questions are there for me. So I was like, if I had $100,000, I would go to four of the other highest donors I know and say, hey, will you all match me $25,000 four times? So 50000 for each each player, basically. I'd go after four offensive linemen and one person match me 25000 four different people. And what I would do is I would want four strong offensive linemen. We could find the fifth in the house, but I want to go get four strong transfers. What that gets is four offensive linemen, 50000 in NIL, plus their scholarship checks. What is that, $2,000 stipend a month? Jack, you played previously. What was it last? Al- almost. So uh, it, probably like seventeen. So let's just let's just round up to 2000 That's seventy k a year to come play football at ECU and get four strong transfer offensive linemen. That was my theory. I thought it'd be good in the fifth one. We would, we would find in house. But I really like that. That's a yeah. I like that. Man went deep. <laughs> the true businessman came out yeah. of Caden there, like multiplying the money and doing all. Well, that. I got to find some partners. So <laughs> if we, if any big ECU donors want to talk about NIL strategy, I'm always open. Uh, when Do you I, have the hundred K to start up with? Not yet, but when I get there, <laughs> I'll be a part of the circles. So, but. but hey, yeah. speaking of hundred K, Caden. Close his biggest deal at work today. Oh my God. Let's go. <laughs> Had to give him a shout Way out. Way to be a shark. <laughs> <laughs> Drew, what would you do with $100,000 right now to give to ECU Athletics and NIL? Yeah, if I get hundred k and I donate it to NIL, I'm probably staring the head coach straight in the face and telling him this $100,000 goes to getting the best possible quarterback we can. QB, after already getting two? Well, like, oh, like, this is, like, specific, like, yes. DC. <laughs> this is right now, I, yes. Oh, yeah, well, I think O-line is definitely, like, the biggest goal at this point. Like, yeah, like, we, we got some dudes coming back, but uh, <laughs> 100000 definitely goes to O-line. And 
maybe I'll give it a little bit of basketball. Give it a little bit of basketball? Yeah, maybe okay. like 80-20 football, basketball. All right. Drew didn't think this one out. <laughs> he Drew just saw the that. text and was like, I got this. <laughs> Jack, what would you do? Uh, well, you really have to think as think of it like you're an NFL GM. And you're signing players to a four-year contract that renews every year. Because mm-hmm. you got to keep them happy. And uh, so that will kind of be on the second part of mine. But this first part, I'm taking 50000 just splitting it down the middle. And I'm getting an offensive star that I could like build my franchise around, so-called. Uh, whether that's a left tackle or, or like kind of first, I was thinking a wide receiver that's like balls up, like it's his, no doubt about it. Um, so I'd like to see that if I had an extra 50k just sitting around, uh, big left tackle or a wide receiver that you could really just build around and trust and and have them there for four years. Uh, the next 50,000, I would actually keep it in the program. Uh, oh, I think that's that a good one. Returning talent to Greenville, um, I think that's important. And like I said earlier, and, and we've seen it with uh, Antoine Jackson, that it's a year to year thing now. Mm-hmm. You got to keep kids happy and got to like renew their contracts, basically. So I would look at that right now, um, probably for defensive purposes. Uh, we've had a pretty good defense the last two years. And so I think you want to keep a couple of those main pieces like JD Lampley, uh, young guys like that. So 50,000, I'd, I'd kind of put towards keeping guys in Greenville that we need um and the other 50 i'd go get a almost if you will franchise star on offense i really thought i was gonna blow everyone away with my theory but jack was pretty competitive they both were pretty good <laughs> drew's was freaking amazing up there so i would look at him in the face and tell him i need a quarterback well, we, i thought we were talking <laughs> we just like this in general <laughs> coach houston quarterback <laughs> what would you do hold um so there's a couple ways you could go about it i think left tackle if you could go get a lockdown left tackle uh, for the blind side of a right-handed quarterback, I think that's a way you could go. Um, I certainly wouldn't be mad at that. I also would – I think that's one way to go. I think I would give the coach the option. I would say go get a left tackle, go get a running back, mm-hmm. which I think – look, Keaton Mitchell – look, I love Rajay and I love the guys to death that we have here, but Keaton Mitchell was a difference maker. He's a different maker in the NFL. If you could go get a running back that maybe isn't Keaton Mitchell but as close as you could be to that with home run speed – just going to get it. I mean, step right in, you know, day one and be an uh, All-American in this conference or all-conference performer. Electric returner. Yeah, I think you could go do that. Now, is 100000 going to do that? I mean, 100000 has got to be. I mean, how much are these kids getting? And they might be getting a lot, but I would go get a Georgia transfer, an Alabama transfer, someone that maybe was a five-star freshman who didn't play. Try to bring them here with hundred k and just let them be an all-star for a couple years. Um so what position? Running back or running back or so I would say I want to run I want either want a left tackle. I don't want to split the money. I okay. think hundred K you, you need to go get a star with it instead of just splitting it and getting someone decent. So I would either give hundred K to a left tackle, running back, or kind of shocker here. Not really shocker, but I think if you can go find a stud corner, which I know we've already kind of got a corner out of the portal um, from West Virginia. But if you can get a lockdown corner from across from Siobhan, who I think is an NFL, I know is an NFL corner. I've played NFL corners and I've played Siobhan. Two years ago, I played Siobhan. He's an NFL corner. Yeah. Um, I think if you go get a lockdown corner, that would be huge. That defense comes back even better. The offense already looks good. Um, if any of those transfers pan out at quarterback, at receiver, at offense in general, and John David Baker, if he does anything on offense, like the defense was already stud. If you could go get another lockdown corner, I think it'd be pretty good. You know, Holton, you didn't get to see this guy, but I think we do have an electric running back that was a freshman last year, Javius Bond. I'm, I I've been impressed can. with him. Yeah. So that's why, but that's also why I would give the option of coach, be like, get one of these three positions because he could be like, look, we already have one at running back. Because I did see him some. I saw him in the spring game and stuff like that, and I was very impressed with him. I knew he was banged up some last year, um, but I, that's what I would do with it. And then. Kind of like Jack said, if it's a few months ago, months ago, could you keep the corner that left, or would you go get a new one? Like, because he was supposed to be a stud, had a good game versus App State, had a good year. Um, weird about that though is, it, from what y'all told me, he thought he was going to Miami and didn't get offered from Miami out of the portal. That's what I believe, but not sure. Yeah, um, who knows about that? No, so I like the I like I like our three theories, Drew. Do better next time. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I would like to see what people think. Who had the best theory? That'd be awesome. I think Drew did. I vote Drew. <laughs> Quarterback. <laughs> I thought it was just like in general. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that segment was brought to you by Worth Chiropractic. Worth Chiropractic is your local choice for chiropractic care. 
automobile accident. They'll specialize in treating automobile accidents, slips and falls while working closely with your attorney. Everyday back and neck pains or sports-related injuries, they offer safe, natural care to get you back to being you. No drugs or surgery, so it's convenient, comfortable, and cost-effective. The first consult is free. Worth chiropractic. Two, lo- two convenient locations on Arlington Boulevard. Free consultations, and they'll work with your lawyer to get you back and with your insurance. To get you back to being you, 1-800-BACK-DOC today. I might, need, I might need to call the back doc. I was sitting on the couch watching sports last night and I got up after 30 minutes. Oh my God. I pulled something. And so my, I, uh, my I got a number the call. All you, all you need to call is 1-800-BACK-DOC today <laughs> and it'll get you right. fixed up. I'll have to do that. <laughs> oh, last segment of the day. And the boys, I think went 500 in the betting segment, except Jack Powers, <laughs> who is defeated. I'll, uh, I'll go down with the sword on this one. Um, <laughs> My bets last week, Brock Purdy missed by one completion. Tough loss, but overall, win in my heart. We won. Yeah, you know. Um, and then Patty Mahomes, over one and a half touchdown passes. First series of the game, first drive, touchdown pass. I look at Drew, I'm like, oh, I'm up. Like, first series of the game, touchdown pass. Like, I'm good. Doesn't do it. Doesn't Jack do it. was hyped up in our group chat when Mahomes threw a touchdown first drive. He's like, that's a lock. That's the easiest bet. Doesn't throw another. Yeah, <laughs> bad bad week for me. Uh, I promise you, I'm doing everything in my power to turn it around. Um, I'm sure no one's actually following my picks right now, but hey, once I start heating up, you will. Big news in the betting world, though. So we're just getting warmed up because on March 11th, the real deal comes. North Carolina, yep. it's finally legal. So hey, we're just warming up for you guys. So that become March time, you just got to follow our bets. We'll be handing out free money by no, the time. Nobody comes. cares about a preseason record. <laughs> hey, and on March 11th, we will all four submit an official ticket. So we'll see what March 11th has that day or that week, and we'll put the official ticket online so everyone knows we are about our bets. Yes. Yeah, so. So if you don't follow us on X yet, follow us at Holt Ayler Show. We post, post our bets every single Thursday night um, heading into the weekend, heading into the next week. So anything we talk about on the show, we will post the bets there. You can follow them. Just see if the boys are winning before, uh, before March 11th <laughs> comes. Because, look, I'm telling you, we're going to be handing out free money come March 11th. Caden, who do you got this week? Yeah, so I'm going to go to San Diego State College Basketball right out the gate. I picked them a couple weeks ago when they're at New Mexico in the Tried pit. to warn you. I lost. You're right. New Mexico is a great game. They also blew a 16-point lead. Mm. But I'm going to go back to San Diego State. They're playing number 18 Utah State at home. So it's at San Diego State. And one thing, if you follow college basketball, home teams win. Home teams win so big so often. Um, So I'm following San Diego State. They've actually played three of the last five games, the same teams. And if you look at the eye test, which you really don't want to do in betting a lot of times, but I'm going to do it here because these two teams are so evenly matched. Um, they both play beat. Uh, they both played Boise last. Uh, San Diego State lost by one point to Boise, and Utah State beat them in overtime. That's a close matchup. They both blew out Wyoming, and then they both recently lost to New Mexico. So if I'm going to follow the basketball gods here, I'm going to pick San Diego State with a close, probably minus two, minus one and a half. Maybe minus three at home. We'll see what the spread is, but I'm taking San Diego State. Um, and then second game, we're going to go to... Can't wait to hear this. I think me and Jack got the same one here. Battle of the Blues, you know, Tobacco Road Showdown, Carolina versus Duke. Uh, again, this week I'm following... I love the road dogs usually, but I'm following the basketball gods here. Bet home. Both these... Uh, actually, not both these teams. Carolina hasn't lost a uh, home game this year. Uh, 16 and 3. Yeah, Duke has lost two home road, road games. I'm stuttering all over myself right now. Whoa. But I I think the biggest matchup here is going to be, uh, you know, like Carolina. They've lost the last two mm-hmm. last year to Duke. Uh, Duke swept them last year. I think this is a whole nother Carolina team. I actually think Duke is kind of soft this year. Just saying it. It's in the Dean Smith Center. So I think Carolina wins this one. And I think it will be another close spread. I'm taking Carolina. Drew Dotter, the producer. Who are you taking this week? All right. I've done a lot of research into this. I'm really trying to go two and zero. First one to go two and zero. Well, Drew, you're winning right now. The overall record, you're winning. You, uh, someone needs to go two and zero this week. So go. Yeah. So I'll get that done for y'all. <laughs> All right. So I got two Saturday basketball player props. I know those are a little hard because you kind of got to predict what the lines will be. But um, uh, Luca, Luca Doncic over points, rebounds, assists. His line is typically at 51. It might get bumped to 52 for Saturday. 
uh, is against Milwaukee. Milwaukee is bottom 10 in points allowed to guards. And ever since Kyrie has gone down, Luka has been electric, dropping 73, 28, and 45. Uh, so I think, and he does everything. He rebounds, he assists. Uh, he's practically the whole offense without Kyrie. So I think he'll get that easy, and he plays good against top teams. And then my other one for Holton. Uh, oh, let's go. I this got a Knicks a Nick. one. Let's go. I got a Knicks one. All right, so Saturday also, uh, the Knicks take on the Lakers at Madison Square Garden. And uh, the Lakers, this will be their fifth straight away game going to Madison Square Garden. And they got a back-to-back in that stretch. And with LaFraud, he's old now too. So, I mean, you can't that long. Uh... <laughs> Drew, no, Drew's a big LeBron fan, so don't back away from this one. Oh, I'm not backing down. Yeah. But, like, go ahead, Drew. I'm, I'm realistic. All right, so uh, the Lakers are also ranked eighth in points allowed to guards. And Jalen Brunson, without an OG Ananubi, potentially might not play. And Julius Randle's down. So I think Brunson's carrying a big load of that offense. Uh, no homo, that sounded bad. But, um, <laughs> and so I'm, I'm doing his over on field goals attempted. His line is typically at 23. It might get bumped to 24. I still think he takes 26, 27 shots. He's a big part of that offense, and I think he'll continue to be. Drew, I tell you, um, thank you for recognizing the Knicks. The Knicks, look, I've had two NBA bets on the Knicks, and guess what I am with the Knicks? 2-0. Two and oh. two I and thought oh. you lost one. No, not with the Knicks. I have not. Not mm-hmm. with the Knicks. I've lost college basketball. I'll have to go back and check that. Drew, I almost took the Lakers game. First of all, shout out to the Knicks. They um, they literally are 14-2 and two since the trade. So everyone who hated the trade, including me, I'm biting my tongue now because they have killed it since then. Climb in the East, going to eventually win. But this week, I am not going to take the Knicks. But before we get to that, I just want to say shout out to Anson Belt for sponsoring this podcast. We could not do it without you guys. Anson Belt, over 10,000 combinations. Uh, Holus Belt, micro adjustable, literally the best belt in the game. Once you wear this thing, you will not want to wear anything else. The boys got theirs last week. I know they were hyped up. We posted on our ex at Whole Ayler Show. Boys, how do you like your new belts? Let's hear it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. David. Yeah, thank you. Um, I like the belts a lot. Um, I know uh, after we got them, like, I was impressed with the designs. I mean, like, we were sitting in here, like, trading, like, which, <laughs> which ones do we want? Um, I, I, we probably spent, like, 15 minutes just deciding, like, what belts uh, we'll take because we each got three. So um, I'm impressed. Like, there's a bunch of different designs. Uh, like Holton said, like, they're great. Uh, you can adjust them easy. They're just a great belt to have. I've got some behind the scenes news actually from Mr. David himself. Uh big contributor obviously Team Bone. Yep. He's got some uh some NIL deals that haven't been unveiled yet with some players on the team. Okay. Uh so be on the lookout for those. They haven't announced it yet. I'm assuming they'll be announcing it soon, but big shout out to him for all all he does Let's for Pirate Nation. Thank you. Anson Belt, go to AnsonBelt.com to look that up. Jack, what are your bets this week before we move on? All right, uh, so like Caden mentioned earlier, I got UNC to beat Duke. Uh, before the show, we were kind of talking about it, and we were a little wishy-washy, and I was like, Caden, who you got? And he was like, you got to wait till it starts. So uh, <laughs> glad we're on the same team for that one. This next one is highly controversial. Um, I almost want to just fade myself and switch my pick right now because I'm a little cold. Oh, um, boy. All right. I'm going to do it. I'm going to fade myself. You're switching right yeah, now? Yeah, I'm Guess switching I'm right now. If he gets this wrong after going 0-2 and then you switch it again. So I had, I had Houston going into the Allen Field house to beat Kansas on Saturday. Houston's good. I'm switching it. Oh. I'm taking Rock Chalk Saturday to beat the Cougars. So I'm taking UNC and Kansas. I, I like the switch because Kansas, looking at it right now, is 10-0 at home. And the Big 12 is the toughest conference. And, that, you know, they're going to show the new little brother in town, this is Big 12 basketball. Yeah, and Houston just went to uh, UT in Austin on the road and barely escaped. And UT's not even ranked. And it was it went to overtime. So once I started looking at that stuff, I was like, you know what? I'm fading myself. Let's get hot. Let's get in the right direction. I know Holton doesn't want to talk about UT, but we, we'll, we'll hear your bets. Yeah, it took Texas last week, and they just – completely got destroyed at BYU. They were soaking in their own embarrassment after that. I was after posting that on Twitter. That was horrible. Um, so shout out to Texas for the L, but shout out to the Knicks for the W. Going 1-1 one one last week, going 2-0 and this week, getting ready for March 11th. And first of all, I agree with you guys. I, I have UNC Moneyline at home. Um, I think Duke has some sketch losses. 
Carolina hasn't lost since December 20th before Christmas. These dudes are just winning and winning. They're not just winning close games. They're blowing people out. Yeah. So uh, Duke has some sketch losses. You talked about it. Pitt at home is a weird loss. Uh, I got UNC money line. I think that's a good one. Um, so that's going to be real bad if we post it on our X and we all and they lose. Yeah. So uh, that well, that would suck. Another thing to talk about that Duke sketchiness this year. They just haven't been the same Duke team. I think they had they had a win over ranked Michigan State and a win over Baylor, and both those teams have proven they're just a little shaky themselves. So I like this Carolina team. I agree with you there. I do. And then my next bet is Wichita State Saturday tip off at 1 p.m. at Memphis. Memphis is 15 and five. Lost their last three games. So they got a game Wednesday night. We film on Tuesdays obviously come out on Thursdays. So they will have one there, but they've lost the last three leading up to this Wednesday night game. I I am going to take, though, I don't think Wichita State's very good. They're 9-11. I'm going to take Memphis to cover the spread in this one. Obviously, they're going to win. I think they're going to win. They've, they've got beat by some bad teams recently, but I'm going to have Memphis turning it around. I think they're going to win Wednesday, and I know that they're going to win on Saturday at 1 p.m. versus Wichita State. That spread might be 10 points. Take it. <sighs> Memphis is very, very talented. It I'm is a home you. game. It yes. is a home game. It is tough. College basketball on the road is yes. tough, so you have a point. So those are our bets. We'll post them on X at Holt Ayler Show. Speaking of X, before we close, get us to 500 followers. If you didn't notice, we did not have a live caller this week, and that is because if you get us to 500 followers, we are going to do a live, hour-long, pretty much fifth-quarter call-in show without a game. You, you guys can just call in for an entire hour and ask us questions live, not recorded like we're doing now. You're going to do this live on Pirate Radio a five o'clock hour on Pirate Radio, then we release it the next day as well. But get us 500 followers on X at Holt Ayler Show, and we will do an hour long call in. You guys can call and ask us whatever the heck you want live, and we'll give you a chance to do that. You can ask, How do you throw football with so, such small hands, Caden? You can ask Holton how he treats his balding. You can ask either of those. It don't oh, matter. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> That's Trey. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, Caden, for that. Um, you can even ask, how did me and my father infiltrate ECU Athletics with local politics and how I became the starter because my dad was the PA announcer? I'll get into that and how all that happened and how we snuck, snuck our way in there. That's truer than people think, so yeah, I'd I know. love to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, I know, me too. Local so politics, but... At Holt Ayler Show on X and get us to 500 followers and we'll do that. And then every milestone from there, we've talked about it, we're not going to have a live caller during these shows anymore because every milestone, we're going to have an hour-long show just for that. Yeah. Um, I think that'd be pretty cool. Tell us what you guys think. Also, before we stop and you know cut this show, we want to give a shout-out to the local politics guy. He's still in hiding. He's still behind anonymous and we can't find out wherever you are (laughs) so we're gonna find you we look we have a year (laughs) we have a year deal with with fight radio this thing we're going every thursday on uh this podcast stuff so stop hiding because we're gonna find you either way i know you're anonymous and you still call in you still comment on this stuff one of these days you're gonna you're gonna fess up and we're gonna get you on the show so uh boys that's it episode four goes by quick we'll see you next week we'll see you next week thanks for joining